Catherine here. Welcome to the latest Composer's Thoughts on Craft series on conceptualization. So for this video, I thought I would talk about conceptualization relating to both the music, which I've talked about a fair bit, um, but as I'm making the video at the moment for Comeback, I thought I'd talk about that and entwine it with a bit of the motivation and intention behind the work, which is partly, partly relational, partly spiritual, partly politically driven. And um, in order to explore that territory, I wanted to sort of lead you in. So, so on the album, there's a section where Omar does a little chant with the drum in a composition called Look to the Heavens. And it sounds like this. Um, goes on like that. I don't want to give away what is meant by that phrase, but if you penetrate into the language, which is something we're going to talk about in a minute with meaning and resonance, um, and its place in, in conceptualization, you will be able to get a sense of what those words are saying. I've hinted at it before with referring to uh, Graham Hancock's work, who's a huge influence for this album. Um, he is an independent writer, studied as a journalist, I believe, and has branched into all sorts of all sorts of fields, looking at um, looking at archaeology, looking at geology, and he really he really goes the depths with his research to to back up his books. Um, yeah, so the conch conch shell. Um, a lot of the conceptualization of this album relates to or taps into symbolism, global symbolism, ritualism, um, archetypes. Uh, the strongest one by far, of course, is the Divine Mother. Um, and Omar is suggested to be a mother archetype um, character. So this is what a conch sounds like. It's not the easiest thing in the world to play, but it's a rather beautiful and very unique um, timbre. So that's going to be on the album. It's also going to be in the film clip. And it's important because um, Omar in I Am Song of the Earth, she actually finds this down, down by the sea and, and claims it as her own. Anyway, so I just want to read to you a couple of little excerpts about some of the symbols in the work. Um, what will we start with? This light is very bright. I've got a backlight here. I think I need some glasses. Okay. So a conch. A horn-like shell often used as a ceremonial musical instrument and symbolising in many coastal traditions the primordial creative voice, notably in India and Polynesia. Indian mysticism links the conch to the sacred sound Om and to the breath of Vishnu that fills the universe. It is one of the eight Buddha symbols of good augury. In Greece, it is the attribute of each of the sea god Poseidon's tritons. Its spiral form could suggest hearing as well as sound, and is in Islamic tradition, it symbolized attention to the word. So I mentioned the word before, and... I'll just show you something I wrote in the kitchen. Part of the key to understanding and penetrating into the heart of language, word and vibration, to get to the many layers and levels of meaning and resonance, is to understand that the word is a transmission, as delivered by a conscious being, as something that's qualified by will, um, given intent by emotional energy. So. A lot of contemporary music is what I regard as highly unconscious. It is expressing not very high levels of intelligence a lot of the time. Um, very, very based in um, the lower expressions of humanity, let's say. I don't want to get onto that too much. Um, but it's important in this play to, on this play, in this work, 
um, the concept of this album to penetrate into language a little bit because I don't spell out the story as such. I suggest what happens in um, in time or Oma suggests it rather my character. So I said before that Oma is meant to be an embodiment of the Great Mother. So this wonderful book, Complete Dictionary of Symbols, is um, it's a great reference when I'm doing work. Linked with nature, the earth and its waters, fertility, nourishment, warmth, shelter, protection, devotion, but also with stifling love, mortal destiny and the grave. Paleolithic carvings, perhaps 30,000 years old, suggest that swollen-breasted maternal figures were the earliest of all fertility symbols. And although many cosmogenies identify male or dual-sex creator divinities as the original source of life, it is possible that they were predated by worship of mother goddesses personifying nature, the earth, or the creative force itself. In Native American mythology, Mother Earth, or Earth Mother, with her male counterpart and consort, Father Sky, or Sky Father, is usually the offspring of the remote supreme divinity or great spirit. So, in I Am Song of the Earth, Oma first came to our attention as a being that was transmigrating out of the body of a turtle. And the turtle is also a cross-cultural symbol of, of the mother um, and also linked with, with, with world mythologies. Um, actually, I have to keep putting these glasses back on. So the sea, the ocean itself is very important. Very important in this story and very important for Come Back, the film clip that will come out if all goes well, on 8th of June, World Oceans Day. In many traditions, the primeval source of life, formless, limitless, inexhaustible and full of possibility, is the sea. In Mesopotamian myth, life arose from the mingling of Apsu, the sweet waters on which the earth floated, and the salt waters, personified by the chaos goddess Tiamat, who gave birth to all things and whose destruction led to the organised world. In Genesis, God moves upon the face of the primordial sea. The Hindu creator god Vishnu sleeps on a serpent coiled upon the sea. The sea is a maternal image even more primary than the earth, but implies also transformation and rebirth. It is also a symbol of infinite wisdom and in psychology, of course, of the unconscious. We swim in the infinite sea of the unconscious. Um... So that's just a little look into some of the symbolism that I'm representing through the character Omar and through Comeback and in the story in the album. I wanted to also highlight, this is a little bit academic -y here, but I wanted to just read a few passages and, and talk about the earth itself and hint on a little bit of political speak. So this is a this is a little a passage from um, Richard Schechner's book Performance Theory. Um, performance art revolutionised my creative practice um, at uni. I couldn't they the university I was going to scrapped a music program at the time, and um, so I had to choose another major if I wanted to keep going, and I chose performance art. So it was great. This is chapter three: drama, script, theatre, and performance. The phenomena called either all drama theatre, performance, occur among all the world's peoples and date back as far as historians, archaeologists and anthropologists can go. Evidence indicates that dancing, singing, wearing masks and or costumes, impersonating other humans, animals or supernaturals, acting out stories presenting time one at time two, isolating and pre preparing special places and or times for these presentations, and individual group preparations or rehearsals, are coexistent with the, the human condition. Of countless examples from Paleolithic times, none is more interesting than the cave of Tuk Dioboe, um, yeah, which is a cave, I guess. And they go on to say, this cave is not the only one to make it difficult, if not altogether inaccessible in its performance space. These early theatres, or shall I call them temples, are hidden in the earth, lit by torch, and the ceremonies enacted therein apparently concerned hunting fertility. Yeah. Um, 
But it was not only animal fertility that Stone Age humans celebrated. Figures, carvings, paintings and symbols depict human fertility as well. The most ancient are of enlarged vulvas and or huge thighs and buttocks, not unlike what females of some non-human primates display during estrus, or of pendant milkful breasts. <laughs> so his work I found uh, really good when I went to uni, had a, a big resonance with. Um, now I'm going to get to some of the political and uh, it's hard to separate politics and spirituality for me because ultimately everything's about relationship and what is politics in the world but the the governance of the relationship between all things by power structures. So um, there are some wonderful folk uh, in England who publish uh, an app that you can get online called the Deep Time uh, Deep Time Walk, and it's a really wonderful uh, cooperative um, work between scientists and artists to to express, I guess, deep ecology concepts and celebrate our living Earth and the history of of Earth and really the mystery of, of the creation of everything that we live within. So um, they published these beautiful cards very recently and I snapped some up straight away to, to go along with it. So deep time cards. I just wanted to share some statistics from there. Um, I hope it's okay with the deep time walk people. Uh, so a present day earth snapshot. Distance from the sun. 147 to 152 million kilometers. Atmosphere, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. I'm not sure what AR is. Uh, I'd fail the science test right now. <laughs> Equatorial diameter, 12,756 kilometers. Continental crust, 335 kilometer average. Oceanic crust, 7 kilometers. Lithosphere, 75 kilometers. The mantle, magnesium and uh, Fe silicates 2,900 kilometers. The outer core 2,200 kilometers. The inner core 1,200 kilometers. Core temperature 5,700 degrees centigrade. Wow. Um, axial inclination. So that's our Earth's axis. 23.44 degrees. Um, they go on about surface gravity, water, average ocean depth. Surface area, 510 million square kilometres. So these are some, some statistics here. Um, they're not statistics. These are some scientific facts about the Earth. And that's one of the beautiful things about the, the Deep Time app. It takes you, if, if you want to appreciate this, if you want to uh, work on your relationship with the Earth, buy the app because over, I think it's a four kilometre walk, you walk through the the entire timeline of like the birth, you know, from the Big Bang right to the to the present, and it will help to put everything in perspective. Um, and it's really really beautiful. So they did these cards, and in them um, they're referencing the Earth Charter, which if you don't know about, I encourage you to look up. There's um, there's many. <laughs> really good initiatives to promote um, to steal a Buddhist to right relation with the earth um, you've got the earth charter you've got the rights of nature which was birthed out of Ecuador uh, nearly might even be about 10 years ago now um, oh the earth charter there's, a, there's another one um, and a recent recent edition if you really want to get involved in uh, helping to protect the earth you can get involved and become a signatory to the earth protectors trust fund which is an initiative set up by Polly Higgins um, a UK environmental based lawyer and she is uh, doing amazing things um, with her group of people and they're proposing to create the the infrastructure whereby um, people can be prosecuted for ecocide, which is basically crimes against the ecology of the, the planet or crimes against all life. Um, so 
in that you can help financially support and, and go on record as being a, um, a signatory to that and help stand by um, and bring that into being. And it's been given some really serious, um, some really serious thought at some, yeah, some very high levels uh, by some amazing people. Um, Indirectly, all the funds you can, you can go onto their website, um, Mission Life Force. Let me have a look. Yeah. Um, Mission, you can go to Mission Life Force, you can go to StopEcocide.Earth, Earth Protectors Trust Fund. This is deviating a little bit from my work, but it's really tied in because um, both the Earth Protectors Trust Fund and another social political movement that is um, birthing at the moment. Um, called Extinction Rebellion, um, are really about the people rising up and claiming their power and asserting their right for creating and sustaining a society which honours all things, not just humans. In scientific jargon, this word was come up with that, that captures that beautifully. I can barely see here. And it's called the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene is borrowing from geological terminology, um, putting the anthrop, which is like related to the human genus or whatever, um, and Pocene, so epoch, epoch, um, age, um, and it's putting them together. And <laughs> in some of my other work, I've talked about how the, you know, the souls of the future will be able to literally dig into the strata of the earth and then what they're going to be finding is layers of layers of plastic and synthetics and all these things you know compacted like what we have fossils you know imagine the earth a million years from now and what will be found about our our age and our and our civilization and it's going to be this complete complete uh stark contrast to everything that existed before it you know we've become masters of matter um, to the point of not caring about matter and what we're doing because we don't get it, you know. Um, so the Anthropocene, oh, crikey, I can barely read this. Oh, this is terrible. I'm really struggling to see. In 1962, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, which, building upon the work of luminaries such as John Moore and Aldo Leopold, inspired by Arnie Ness, the father of, deep, father of deep ecology, to formulate his deep ecology approach in which all light is understood to have intrinsic value. This helped kickstart a global movement which radically opposes the dominating attitude to nature. In 1972, James Lovelock published his Gaia Hypothesis with Lynn Margulis joining him soon after to, to develop the concept. This is that book. James Lovelock's guy. Um, it's become a catchphrase for for the Earth uh, now. Everyone talks about you know Gaia. Gaia is the name now of the, the Earth Mother. Um, today, rampant industrialization and hedonistic consumerism have become separated from the wider web of life, seeing Earth as little more than a resource to be exploited for maximum profit. This worldview, whilst providing great advances in technology, with corresponding increases in human health and economy, economic prosperity for some, is causing a social and ecological crisis of pollution, deforestation, biodiversity loss, ocean acidification and rapid climate change, resulting in increasing temperatures, rising sea levels, negative impacts to multiple human systems, as well as initiating the sixth mass extinction. So that is what the deep time warp people have put on one card about the Anthropocene epoch, dating it zero million years. Um, Phanerozoic, uh, and then statistics on the sun, the moon, the day, the temperature, average temperature, oxygen, and carbon stats. Um, oh, where was I going to go next? So, sixth great extinction. There are those out there who deny it's happening, same with uh, climate change, and then there are those out there who have been publishing works for years and years and years, you know, cutting-edge scientists. It is happening. It is happening, and we are driving it. And the thing that really um, 
frustrates me, and this is where I've tried to weave into the to the album what it's all about, is that there's a lot of emphasis given to to climate change, but not as much emphasis given to habitat loss. And we are literally uh, taking the home away from life, you know, and uh, urbanizing and industrializing everything. And life cannot live on a dead planet. Um, it's just insane what we're doing. It really is. So in the Call of Omar album, um, the concept that I'm really trying to communicate is that we have been around, human civilizations have been around for a long time. They come and go. Um, different cultures around the world have their rise and their fall. You know, the, the ancient Egyptian, the, the Greek, the Incan, the Mayan, um, Mesopotamia. You look at it. There is the rise, there is the fall. Nothing is meant to last forever. But in historical times, we were able to move over the face of the earth and we would have wars for territory and all those things and um, te technologies would be exchanged along with um, with tools and wares. But with my story, what I'm trying to communicate is through this ancient character Omar who's in part like the mind of the earth herself, who has the earth's memories and who has come into the present time to help share what happened before in prehistory in the era where we don't have much recorded history so what she's sharing about is previous civilization that was that um, went to an, into its decline by major cataclysmic events um, on the face of the earth which Graham Hancock talks about in his work so you can look into that and um, you know see see what I'm looking at and um, she helps to bridge this this gap in the memory. So we've all, you know we've been we've been taught that you know human civilization goes back to this point, the birth of hu human civilization in Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent and blah blah blah. But that's all been blown out of the water now with Gobekli Tepe and other sites around the world, um, which is predate um, you know predate the pyramids and all that stuff, like you're looking at 11, 12,000 years ago and it's linked in to the last ice age um, and yeah, the earth being a very different place. So the concept of, of, of the album is that we go through these periodic cycles um, where human civilization flourishes it rises and then it falls, and that's even talked about in the in the Hindu and in all world mythologies. You know that time is not a fixed thing; it is it is cyclic, and these cycles of existence come around again. Um, I draw tremendous inspiration from from mythologies. So the album is my musical mythology, um, my way of presenting uh, my thoughts. On very important matters you know I think for most people that I know that that I talk to many are really deeply saddened at the loss of life on earth because everyone can see just in their limited lifetime because the human lifetime is only very finite what we've lost and what we will continue to lose unless we change our ways and the very foundation the structures of life on earth as we live and govern it that's why you can't escape from the politic because it's all related to way of life um, and those way of life is supported by you know it is like it is like a massive machine with all the you know like all those cogs and really intricate thing and I'm finding this in doing my film clip at the moment that um, it's like trying to put a jigsaw puzzle together so a couple of weeks ago I went down the west coast and did some filming for the film clip for comeback and I've got all those on a timeline in DaVinci Resolve. Um, so there's five different lots of video to chop up for the usable bits. And then I've got to seriously sit and give them some critique as to what actually makes the cut and what will go on to be ultimately the timeline of the, of the clip. Um, 
And I'm finding that process really quite fascinating. Uh, video production is something that I'm learning as I go along. <laughs> we learned a lot out in the field the other day about light and I, I bought an app I thought would help give me more control of my smartphone because it's all been done on smartphone. And um, there's still, you know, subtle light shifts like that. And there's environmental cues which you, you can't control, you know. You can't control when the clouds are passing by in the sky. Um, and little, little things that you learn along the way, like, you know, the light shining off the sand here, and then you hit the you hit the the wall of shadow where the sun's rising behind and then the whole colour tone shifts of <laughs> of the footage and the way the footage appears natively within the phone is different from the way it appears in the app and um, one's recording at this frame rate and one's recording at that frame rate and I'm like, oh my god, you know, it's just so much learning um, just to put a film <laughs> clip together. So... On conceptualization, this whole thing started um, from a song that I wrote for my play, for my other play, for Mandate of Heaven, a few years ago, which you can check out the video for that um, uh, on my on my YouTube by the Mandate of Heaven, um, and then it morphed into a performance. I wrote a couple of other pieces to go with it, and then that morphed into. A live presentation to, to launch a single and a character had this really strong resonance and uh, I thought maybe I should do a concept album <laughs> so that's what I've done um, just paid for the mastering for the comeback and the crickets have been very noisy so I haven't been able to record the voice so uh, that's where we're at with the process just need to record the voice and uh, then that can be imported in um, I recently got a new or it wasn't new, it was a second-hand audio recorder, and that, <laughs> we had that sitting on the rocks, and uh, we were busy filming, and I forgot about it, and then I noticed that the, the windsock on it, this little furry thing, where is it, here, this was saturated, and I'm like, oh no, and um, yeah, it's, it, needless to say, it's gone into salvage to see if it can be rescued, but thankfully, I've got the files, <laughs> <laughs> so I've got the ocean sample um, and I've got to import that also into the audio track as well as doing the voice because I wanted to have a congruence between the place where we were and a native audio sample as opposed to one that I'd gotten from Freesound which is where I've got a lot of my samples previously. Um, so you know I think all this is interesting um, an interesting way of documenting work and process and the thoughts that go behind it that you, you know you probably just don't necessarily come across unless you read a book or something about someone's creative life so maybe it's a little self-indulgent but it might help some other other artists to um, to develop their work and ideas and realize that you really do have all the tools and resources that you need yourself to begin you know you don't need um, big lavish tools and, and production, you start with what you've got and um, if you can make great work with that, well, you know, the sky's the limit, you know, as you keep on learning and uh, nurturing um, relationships and so forth. So um, I think I'll end it there. All right. So on conceptualization, the next one that I'll do will be on studio craft. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the video there. And then just little, maybe a couple more things about the, the audio mixing process. I had said that I was going to talk about uh, what I've learned since I did my first album. So I think I'll do that as well. It'll be a little bit retrospective, um, looking at the evolution of, of knowledge and understanding um, and development as an artist over the last 10 years. Um, so much love. Please do take time to look into your relationship with all of life, um, look into what you can do to, to help. There's a wonderful organisation called Earth Guardians which is nurturing youth all around the world um, to encourage them to come into positions of leadership, so I encourage you to look up earthguardians.org. Um, and yeah, you know, there's, there's lots you can do. You've got to uh, 
Appreciate the power of your voice, the power of your words, the power of your deeds, and the power of your relationships. And nurture your ability to create change and go out there and do what you want to do. So do it. Don't let anything get in the way, you know. Um, be a mighty wave <laughs> that crashes upon the shore of all things. <laughs> Much love. <laughs>